I decided to break all those rules because I needed, I needed those sparkly pants. And what those sparkly pants did for me was every time I walked out during the day, you know, wearing them during the day, people would stop me on the street and they would, they would say, I'm sorry, but I just need to tell you, you look like a million bucks. <laughs> and then I just needed to, I just needed them to know this. I, I needed to tell them, well, I just had chemo. I just had my second round of chemo and I lost all my hair and my eyelashes. And then they would, then they would just have even a greater shock and say to me, Oh my God, I, whatever you're doing, keep doing it because it's totally working for you. And that just gave me, that gave me something that a doctor or medicine or something else could never do for me. It was just this feeling of well-being. You know, people could see that I was well on my way to healing. My guest today, Annie Francesca, is a reinvention stylist who helps career and business women over 50 reinvent their lives after divorce, loss, or chronic illness, starting with their wardrobes. After living on a religious commune 30 years ago, the former founder of Victoria Shopping Tours knows that style can be a powerful vehicle for personal expression. Annie relates firsthand to women who dress to keep themselves invisible out of fear of displeasing others. In 2013, an incurable cancer diagnosis woke Annie up to face the pain of her old story. Using a process she calls the adventure principle, she completely reinvented herself from the outside in, starting with her wardrobe. Within less than six months, she became completely cancer-free. Annie remains cancer-free to this day and is the author of Passport to Life, How I Overcame Incurable Cancer Through the Power of Travel. Annie spoke at the Women's Economic Forum in London last November, and she's also been on stage presenting at the Breast Pathology and Cancer Diagnosis Expo in Vancouver. Annie says, today's women are writing books, speaking on stages, mentoring others, and changing the world. Yet they're still dressing themselves according to an old paradigm, dressing to fit in dressing to hide negative body parts, dressing according to an ever-changing, impossible beauty standard passed down from the fashion industry. And this has undermined the self-confidence of women, leading to all kinds of imbalances, like eating disorders, body dysmorphia, spending billions of dollars on clothing and procedures just to fit the standard. Countless women stand in front of their closets, afraid to make a choice about what to wear to work, afraid that someone will deem their outfit to be inappropriate. Annie teaches women how to feel powerful in their own skin every time they get dressed. She's teaching women how to find their superhero cape and how to make power outfits so they feel like they can literally take on the world every time they get dressed. I learned a ton from this interview. And the next day I went out to buy some clothes and I shopped with a whole new mindset. It was awesome. Annie, welcome to the Onward Podcast. Thank you, Emily. It's so great to be here with you. Yeah, I know we've had this interview scheduled for a while, and I've been looking forward to talking with you. Lots changed since you scheduled the interview. Oh, I know, right? (laughs) You are a reinvention stylist, and you help career and business women over 50 reinvent their lives after divorce, loss, or chronic illness, and you start with their wardrobes. So I have to say that um, I have retired, and since I retired, I've don't have the best wardrobe. So I was wondering, I don't think that what I'm wearing today would probably pass muster, but (laughs) it's not the most stylish sweater. (laughs) It's interesting how you started with that because you're already putting yourself down for what Uh you're wearing. And that, that is dressing according to an old paradigm. So the way I work is it's more about how you feel inside your clothes and it's aligning that feeling with a vision that you have for your life. And for me, I call it the million dollar woman. That's who I want to align with when I get dressed. So let's revisit the question then. How do you feel? (laughs) You know, if if you were to think about that ideal as let's say that resonates with you, a million dollars. I feel I feel great. I don't think I'm dressed like a million dollar woman, but I feel like I'm dressed comfortably for what I've got to do today. Yeah. 
So I'm, I'm happy with what I'm wearing. I'm kind of a minimalist and I got rid of all my suits and stuff when I retired. And also I would say that I have a hard time buying clothes because of my height. I'm yeah. 11. And so that I just get frustrated when it comes to finding the clothes that I like and outfits that I like and stuff like that. So. Yeah. Yeah. And you're not alone. First of all, I'm 5'11 myself. Oh, cool. So I have a hard time as well. But a lot of women have a hard time shopping for clothes. That is the it. number one pain point. They hate it. They feel overwhelmed. They don't know where to start. So um, yeah, I resonate with that because uh, that's what a lot of my clients tell me. They hate shopping. And it just makes me, sh- it makes me so sad because we've been so conditioned to look for clothing in a certain way that is doing such damage to our psyche, to our well-being, to our self-confidence. And uh, once you tap into another way of looking at clothing, it completely liberates you to really become more playful and to tune into another aspect of yourself that you might not have considered when thinking about clothing. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. How do we do that? So what I would do first is I, I would take a client and help them to align themselves to what I call the version that is the million dollar woman. And that is not a standard cookie cutter version of, of someone in the same sense that, you know, we have the standard cookie cutter version of what is considered beautiful in our culture, right? That standard is thin and ultra young and, and tall and everything. but aligning yourself with your million dollar woman, she could be anything to anyone, right? Yeah. You decide what those standards are. So it's first getting in tune with that version of yourself. And then you see a vision of how you want to quote unquote, flesh that out with your clothing. Yeah. Very interesting. So how do you recommend women who hate to shop? How should we shop? Where should we shop? Or Uh, how do you find a place to shop? Okay. That's a great question, especially in COVID times, right? Because, you know, we have all these other challenges. I don't know. Are you, are you currently in lockdown where you're at? No, no, no. I could go to uh, Target or I can go to, you know, not that I would buy my clothes at Target, but I can go to some stores, but it's, you know, it's a little harder. And I also live in a rural area. So and going to a mall doesn't sound like yeah, no, I hate malls. I hate you malls. you know, most, are, are, isn't there a stereotype that women love to shop? I don't think there that. is. Yeah, and I don't think I don't think it's true, right? Do you right. think it's true to that yeah. stereotype? Who has time? I don't have time. Right? I don't want to try on all the clothes. It's just yeah, yeah. So going back to your question, then now we have a particularly challenging time in that some areas are in lockdown, like I'm. This, the city where I'm at, Montreal, tomorrow they go into, I think it's called Code Red. So it's full lockdown. So you can't even go into stores and try on things. So what I've done is I've also created a course on how to find stunning used designer clothing for next to nothing. Because a lot of the clothes I own were either $1.50, $3.50, $5, $10. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So that's the fun of, of this process. You don't have to, you know, to be that million dollar woman. Again, it's about the feeling that you're tapping into and not necessarily the, the designer labels or the price point or a trend that you're trying to follow. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, that's pretty cool. And then you can be creative too. I yeah. think you have to have, you have to have the confidence to do that. One of the things I do in my coaching is uh, help women discover their authentic selves. And I would say that part mm-hmm. of that is, you know, dressing in a way that you like to dress, not the way others think you should dress. Yeah, 100%. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then I would also touch on the fact that we have been conditioned to ask ourselves counterproductive questions whenever we go shopping. And those counterproductive questions are quite often, it seems like a productive question but it's already a deflating question. So a woman might go into a mall or a department store and she'll immediately ask herself, oh my gosh, what's here for me? You know, yeah. as, though, as though she's already discounting everything in the store, like there's nothing there for her, right? And then she might bring herself to try on something, but then she walks out of the change room and she says, um, she'll ask a chain or like a, 
a salesperson and, and she'll say, does this flatter me? Does this make my look, my butt look big? Or do I look too old in this? Or do I look too large in this? Whatever. They're all very negative, loaded questions, right? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> and they're not really empowering for women. But these are the questions that we've been conditioned to ask ourselves. And so it's no wonder that we walk out with something that we don't truly love or we'll settle, we'll settle for the, like the little black dress, let's say for $15, you know, just cause it's, it's something, you know, at least we got something for an occasion that we wanted to show up in a better way for. And our daughters learn that because they go to the mall or the dressing rooms with us. Yeah, they do. I can't tell you how many times I've been in a, in a store and a I've witnessed a woman walk out of the change room and she just looks amazing and her friends are all around and she'll, she'll ask those limiting questions and then she'll literally talk herself out of something good. And she'll say, yeah, but where am I going to wear this? It's, right. it's Kelowna or, you know, what's, what, what's my husband going to think? What's my boyfriend going to think? What are people in my city going to think? Right. What questions should you ask yourself, ask your friends? So Instead of asking those limiting questions, does this flatter me? I would start my clients with, how does this make you feel? Is this aligned with your million dollar woman? Is this how you feel? And I take them through a system where they get really clear on what that million dollar woman looks like. And then they have a set of guidelines by which they'll know exactly intuitively which clothes to choose. Where do you shop? You know, well, I wear like an inseam 33. So it seems like most pants are stop at 32 or 31 or something. And then they go, if you get the talls, they're 35 or 36. And I don't always want to wear heels. So, I mean, do you just like, I guess the thing is, is if you want to feel comfortable in your clothes, you can always get them hemmed or something like that. Yeah. A little extra. And then be willing to think outside the box. We're all wearing the same thing. You go, you walk out on any city street and you look at, at people and they're all, we're all wearing the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, we're all wearing a uniform. So uh-huh. why not think outside the box, wear a skirt instead of jeans. Stand out. Yeah. Don't fit in. Yeah. Cause then you don't have to worry about inseam. And the reality is skirts can be a lot more comfortable than, than jeans per se. Yeah. Right. No, you're right. You're right. How did you uh, end up in this kind of a career, helping women reinvent themselves? Well, I always say that I learned fashion from one of the most unlikely of all places, and that is from living in a religious cult. Wow. Yeah. What were you wearing there? (laughs) (laughs) I know it's a true story. So I was very young at the time, um, just newly married, and my now former husband got deeply religious. And um, things quickly spiraled and we went through massive changes. And we ended up living on a, um, it's like a communal dwelling in a very, very remote place. It was maybe 50 people in the community. And I had just given birth to my daughter four days after, or four days before, I should say, going into this religious communal setting in this remote community. So it was there that I was forced to abide by some very, very strict rules. And when it comes to women, as you can imagine, there were far more stricter rules for me than there were for my husband. So one of the things that I remember very, very clearly is is a day where I showed up to what I thought was just a community meeting, but the religious leader, he yelled at me as soon as I walked in saying, you know, how could you show up wearing shorts to a Bible study. So first of all, I didn't know it was a Bible study. And second of all, it's a hot summer day. What am I supposed to wear? And then I look across at my former husband and he's, he's wearing shorts, but I know intuitively not to say anything because you can pick up on the the religious rules that there's a standard for men and there's a standard for women. And so we didn't stay in the situation for much longer than a year after that, but That, like the seeds of that experience stayed with me for a long time. 
just the trauma of it and the rigidity rigidity of it. So what I came to later realize in another monumental life-changing time in my life, I came to realize that the rules of the fashion industry were really no different than the rules of the religious cult that I was living in. Whoa, interesting. Yeah. They're, and they're kind of unspoken rules of the fashion industry, or maybe they're spoken, but are they more unspoken? We've just become so yeah. unconscious to them. It's like we're on this autopilot that every time we go shopping, we don't even pay attention to how damaging these rules are and how we've been conditioned to shop for clothes. We just think it's normal. We just think it's our problem. We think yeah. we, we hate our bodies because there's something innate, innately wrong with us, but that's not the case at all. We think we're, we're terrified of aging because there's something wrong with women, but that's not the case at all. Well, when you, when you age, I'm just being sarcastic, you can't wear sleeveless blouses or anything, and you can't wear something without a high neck to cover your neck wrinkles. And <laughs> that's what the rules say, I right? Know. Right. That's what the rules say. <laughs> yeah. No, that's but I, I can show you countless influencers on Instagram, women in their 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, that are flaunting things that we were told we shouldn't flaunt at a certain age. Yep. I've seen that. I've seen some of them. I can't remember their names and stuff, but I know Elon Musk's mom is one of them. Yeah. May Musk. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. There's another one, Batty Winkle, and uh, she's in her nineties and I love her. Everyone absolutely loves her because- Batty, like uh, B-A-T-T-I-N-G? B-A-D-D-I-E. Batty. Yeah. She's in her nineties. She wears crop tops and what are those- like biking shorts, crop tops, biking shorts in bright neon colors, bright, bright makeup and lipstick, bearing her midriff, bearing her legs, bearing her arms, cleavage. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. Isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. I think you're going to probably, well, you're going to change, you're changing my ideas of what I'm going to wear. And even in this time of COVID, when you can pretty much only dress from your waist up, right? <laughs> because of, yeah. Because of the Zoom calls and stuff. What a fun time to like show up on the call as somebody wouldn't expect you to show up, right? Exactly. Exactly. Like, you know, the beauty of these self-isolation times is we don't necessarily have to walk out on the street. We can start experimenting with our style in ways that we would have never given ourselves permission to do so, right? Yeah. And just start showing up in, in ways that are more playful and fun. And then by the time things open up, then it takes a lot less courage. It takes a lot of courage to show up like a batty winkle. Yeah. You can imagine that when she first started, I'm sure her heart started to pound wildly before she left the house, right? Yeah. And she's thinking, oh my gosh. <laughs> What are people going to think of me? That's awesome. Have you met her or talked with her or messaged her or anything? You should. I want to see if I can on my podcast. Yeah, that would be awesome. I really love hearing people's stories and how, I'm sure back then when you were uh, at that religious convent, you didn't think, well, one day I'm going to be (laughs) reinventing women with how they dress. I mean, you can't, for younger people listening to this, like my daughter or whatever, it's not, she's 24. It's not like she can imagine where she'd be when she's, you know, in her fifties or sixties, but just everybody I've interviewed, it's so cool to hear the story and how a lot of people turn what was painful for them into their passion. Yeah. Yeah. That's the beauty of the pain, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And you had some other pain. You had incurable cancer in 2013, seven yeah. years ago, and you're still here. You're here. Yeah. You got rid of it in what, was it six months or something? Yeah. Well, that was, that was the other life-changing moment that I was going to tell you about. And um, that was where I made this, this monumental discovery about clothing, because um, here I was facing, facing death pretty much. I was, I underwent a surgical procedure to remove a cancerous tumor from my abdomen. And so it was in that moment, I'm just waking up in the recovery room and uh, I could see my oncologist standing near my bedside. And it was then that she, she started to open up her mouth and I thought she would 
have some good news for me. But she, she started to say, you know, your cancer is spread to the lymph and the upper aorta and it's incurable. And so, um, that really did something for me. Why do they have and, to tell you that right when you're waking up? Can't they just? I know. I mean, whew. yeah, I think she, um, well, I, first I got to say she gave me a gift because if she would have held my hand in that moment and said tenderly and sweetly to me, look, sweetie, I don't think you're going to make it. I would have believed her. I would have said, oh my gosh, you're kidding me. Really? And I probably wouldn't have had the big fight that showed up had she, she just said the other thing, right? But she didn't so, say you're not going to make it. She said that it had spread and that it's incurable. That's what she yeah, said. But she didn't yeah. say, I mean, isn't that the same as saying you're not going to make it? I don't know. Yeah. Well, the way that she said the other thing just uh, stirred up this huge fiery passion inside me. And that's when I, I decided, no, Okay, it came with a whole lot of swear words. Yeah. <laughs> no effing way. <laughs> no effing way is this going to be true. I'm going to show you. So that's when I, you know, in that life and death moment, that's where I took my power back. And, you know, it wasn't immediately at that time, but facing chemo, I knew I needed something to bring out my courage, my inner, what I call my million dollar woman now, but I needed I needed something to access that inside me. And so that's what I did was I started to dress that version of me. In a time where I had lost my hair and my eyelashes and my eyebrows, I found this pair of sparkly pants. And I was about to turn 50 at the same time. So I knew I was well-versed in the rules. You know, at 50, <laughs> that's when you can't wear skin-tight pants and you no. can't do sequins. And no. And you can't do it during the day, but I decided to break all those rules because I needed, I needed those sparkly pants. And what those sparkly pants did for me was every time I walked out during the day, you know, wearing them during the day, people would stop me on the street and they would, they would say, I'm sorry, but I just need to tell you, you look like a million bucks. <laughs> and then I just needed them to know this. I, I needed to tell them, well, I just had chemo. I just had my second round of chemo and I lost all my hair and my eyelashes. And then they would, then they would just have even a greater shock and say to me, Oh my God, I, whatever you're doing, keep doing it because it's totally working for you. And that just gave me, that gave me something that a doctor or medicine or something else could never do for me. It was just this feeling of well-being you know people could see that i was well on my way to healing and that i was well on my way not just to vibrant health again but to that woman that i that i wanted to become the one who was a, an author and speaking around the world you know who had big dreams that's who i wanted to step into and and i could see that that's who people were seeing me as what were you doing when you had for a living before you did this? Like when you had the cancer, what were you doing? Well, I've reinvented myself many times. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I left my marriage in 2009 and did a whole bunch of things. Did an internship in tourism and travel in Italy and Ireland. Was going to host life-changing tours to those two countries. So that was something that I was on my way to do just before I got the diagnosis of cancer, right? But before you had that diagnosis, you were thinking that you wanted to write a book and were you already dressing kind of uh, not in accordance with the norms? Or was no, no, I, I could show you photos. It was a lot of gray, a lot of black, just a smattering of red. Yeah, just I was keeping a professional sort of a look, right? Right. Keeping the rules. I remember my husband's like, why? Because I used to wear a lot of gray and black and the brown. And then my mom would say, well, you know, wear some bright colors. So I started doing that. But yeah. um, he would say at one point, like, you should just have like, you could have three suits, a gray one, a black one, and a, and, you know, I don't know, a brown one. And then you just, or maybe a blue one. And then you just switch your shirts around. And it's like, he was telling me to dress like a guy would dress, right? Totally. And I mean, I know that's probably easier because I probably, he said that because I was just complaining that I hate shopping and I hate buying clothes. Yeah. <laughs> trying to be helpful, but it's just interesting. 
Yeah. Well, FYI, the first the first fashion stylist was a man. And he was the gentleman who wrote the book Dress for Success. So he took the same concept that he applied to men and applied it to women. So your husband was was probably just channeling that advice. Channeling that advice. And then I worked my whole career for the military in the Navy. And so, you know, there's clearly certain norms about what you can wear and what not wear yeah. in the Pentagon and in that kind of a working environment. So interesting. And one of the reasons, it's not the reason I retire, but I, one thing I did not miss is wearing suits and high heels. But I think what you're saying is maybe, you know, I could have done something different back then and wore something different, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So you were cancer free within less than six months. Yeah. Hasn't come back. No. And you're convinced a big part of that is your confidence and what you chose to wear and how that helped you recover. Yeah a big part of it. And it was, um, it was just keeping a certain mindset. So I, I wrote about that in a book as well. Yeah. yeah your book is, um, passport to life, how I overcame incurable cancer through the power of travel. And what was traveling? How was that helping? Well, I didn't actually go anywhere because you're not allowed to, when you have chemo, right? You would compromise your, your immune system. So It's about asking the questions around what will bring health into my life. And for me, health was channeling those memories of my travels. It was dressing like that million dollar woman. It was, it was really living as though I was healthy and doing all the things I had been dreaming about doing. That was the mindset that helped me to overcome that diagnosis in less than six months. I have interviewed a couple of people, you know, several that have just talked about the power of conscious manifestation and Mm -hmm. the power of our thoughts and how we create our reality and our thoughts create our reality and whatever we're, we have to really examine what we're thinking. Like you said, all those depreciating negative thoughts about clothes and all of that changing our mindset isn't always easy, but we, and we all have that inner critic, but there's ways to tame that inner critic and there's ways to reinvent yourself like you have. And part of it is when you dress a certain way, it exudes a certain confidence. And even if you maybe don't feel that confidence right away, you start to feel it in the way you're dressing and like yeah. you, the way people reacted to you yeah. when they saw you. Yeah. Well, some of the most famous movies that women just gobble up are about that, are about a woman that, that steps into a vision of herself and she does it with clothing. My Fair Lady is an example of that. Pretty Woman is an example of that. There was a vision conveyed to those women. And when they stepped into it with the right clothing, that's when the magic happened. I told my mom I was going to go buy, um, I said, I need a few new outfits for um you know, just for Zoom, because I feel like I got rid of so many clothes when I uh, retired. And um, now I think the kinds of things I buy are going to be completely different. Yeah. To our conversation. So what's next for you? I have a couple of things on the table, which I don't want to say too much about, but fashion design schools. Awesome. Yeah. Style that changes lives. That's exciting. And I was just thinking that COVID would hold you back, but it's not because there's, you know, we can still be stylish with what we're wearing now. Yeah. Well, the thing about this time is that we're all being squeezed into an identity or a lack of identity, right? right? With the masks and people aren't dressing up and uh, that does so much damage for your well-being as well, right? Yeah. So any way that we can keep this alive, keep alive our our creativity, our playfulness, our own sense of identity. From a business standpoint, it helps you to, to stand out from all the others in, in your industry, right? You, you stand out as a leader. Yeah. People notice you. Yeah. yeah. It gives you a, an upper edge about the, the competition. And again, you when you confidence to be who yeah. you are. Yeah. Totally. And again, when you look at some of the world's most famous people who stood out, you think of the ones that did it with clothing, Elton John, David Bowie, Beyonce, Elton John. <laughs> right? They they just uh, they're head and Gaga. shoulders above everybody else. <laughs> everybody else. Yeah. yeah, Beyonce, Lady Gaga, yeah, Kim Kardashian. You know, I mean, she wears interesting clothes. Yeah, 
So, but yeah, definitely Elton John was the first one that came to my mind. Yeah, I know. Princess Funny. Diana. Yeah, totally. So how do you find clothes that, so you have ways of finding clothes that are not as expensive, you know, like through online, I guess, consignment shops kinds of things. Yeah, that includes uh, like a manifestation process as well. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Of envisioning your million dollar woman and, and then yeah. that would determine where you might go and, and shop for it. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to put your contact information in the show notes, your Instagram. You have a Facebook group, right? I'm phasing out the Facebook group. Okay. It'll just be for, for clients, not for... For anybody, but they can yeah. follow you on Instagram. Yeah. And you have a website. I'll put all that in the show notes along with the link to your book. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, anything else that I didn't ask you that, that to help you bring out a point that you wanted to make? Okay. I think the final point I want to make is... Um, we're all true heroes. We're all true individuals. And we're not made to just be like everybody else, look like everybody else. We're made to, to shine. And so I just invite your listeners to really lean into what does that look like for you? If you could really shine with your self-expression, with your clothing, what would that do for you? And what would that look like for you? That's a really good point. I'm going to get something and show it to you. I created this onward movement and we have a manifesto and it's all cool. about authenticity and disco- discovering your authentic self and releasing fear of judgment so that you can pursue the life of your dreams. And I'm finding that a, a lot of people in that onward movement, like they're women about my age, your age, they haven't really been so busy raising kids, living their life face down, taking care of other people probably wearing what society says we should wear. And they haven't had a, a chance to like look up and think about what do I want for the next phase of my life? And that's kind yeah. of what I went through. I retired in May of 2019. And some of the statements in the manifesto, I think that you would resonate with because we don't need to fit in. We stand out. Yeah. And although we strive to improve ourselves, we know we're enough just the way we are create space for others. We hear you. We're not alone. We're connected. We free ourselves from others' judgments and expectations, and we live our lives aligned with our values. So, and that's a lot of what you're talking about is in your clothing choices, help do some of those things, right? Live your lives in accordance with your values, not the stylist values or what your friends think your outfit yeah. looks like or whatever. What feels yeah. good to you? Yeah, for sure. Thank you for reading that. I love your manifesto. Well, I think as part of, I'm developing a course called the Onward Accelerator, you know, things that we could go through. And I think as, as part of the course, I'll um, include a link to your stuff and say, hey, I mean, clearly I'm not the expert on, on clothing stuff right now. So I can <laughs> <further> to you. <laughs> You'd be surprised. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm excited to go shopping now, actually. Yeah. Well, if you need some help with that, just let me know. All right. Thank you very much, Annie. I really appreciate you being on the Onward podcast. Thank you very much for having me, Emily. So appreciate this conversation. Me too. Connecting with you, yeah. I love every episode I do. I get to learn so many cool things. This episode is publishing on November 2nd, 2020. And on November 5th, 2020, Annie is holding an event where she's going to teach us more about how to dress like a million bucks. So I'll put a link to the event in the show notes, and you can also join the Onward Movement and learn more about it. I'm going to read a recent post that Annie made that talks about her event. 10 fashion commandments you must break before you can dress like a million dollar woman. Commandment one, thou shalt dress to fit in with the crowd. It's dangerous to be different. We need to fit in at all costs. Standing out in a crowd means getting bullied or shamed. People will reject us simply because we look different. Just think back to how much everyone tried to fit in when they were a kid in school. Now take a look at how most people are showing up today. On any given day, do you see people dressing radically different from the rest? Is anyone celebrating diversity that they are unique, one-of-a-kind individual with their creative personal style? Or is everyone dressing the same as everyone else? On the other hand, if you would like to become a million dollar woman, it takes a mindset shift. You must think differently about the way you dress. A million dollar woman knows her worth. She knows she's outstanding. She never settles for second best, not 
in her business, and especially not with her wardrobe. She's not afraid to stand out in a crowd. She knows that her personal style is the first line of contact with her brand, and fitting in is the kiss of death for her business. What do you become to aspire? And here's a comment under that post that I resonate with, and I know most women will. This woman says, what good timing. Since I've been working remotely, I've neglected my attire, my makeup. Elastic waist pants do not make one feel put together. This is the kick in the pants I need to be reminded. This is for me. I can't wait to listen. I hope to see you there. Join us. Have a great week, everyone. Stay safe and healthy.